charting a low-carbon route to growth. Um, we're delighted um, with the panelists that we have here today um, for this important topic, not least um, for China's own uh, green growth strategy, but also for the world, um, and in particular in relation to how one charts that growth path given the tumultuous economic conditions that we're facing in the world at the moment. Um, I'm delighted that uh, James Cameron, um, Vice Chairman and Founder of Climate Change Capital in the UK, will moderate us for this discussion. And I shall hand over to him to introduce the panelists and to lead us through the conversation for the next hour. Um, my name is Dominic Warre. I'm a Senior Director at the World Economic Forum um, in charge of uh, sustainability, environmental and low carbon activities. This discussion and this topic area forms an important part of the program of work that we do at the World Economic Forum with many partners. So I hope you enjoy the discussion um, and I look forward to the debate. Thank you very much. James. Well, thank you very much, Dominic, and uh, for all your work and your team's work on uh, making this a topic for, for our conversation today. Uh, my name is James Cameron. I'm a founder of an enterprise called Climate Change Capital, which is, a, if you like, a specialist investment business focused on low carbon growth in, in all of its forms. I'm also part of the UK Prime Minister's Business Advisory Group, uh, and I'm, I'm really there in order to help communicate the ideas that we're about to discuss for that particular government's uh, uh, analysis of how uh, the UK economy might develop over the years to come. So I'm confident this is a topic that uh, we ought to be discussing, and I'm very pleased to have the panel that we have before you, and we'll give plenty of opportunity to you, the audience, to join in a discussion of what is a fascinating but complex uh, debate about how to make the kinds of investments, including in innovation following on from the previous panel this morning, some of which will be disruptive, so that we can reconfigure our economy around a slightly different pathway, one which was very clearly articulated and authoritatively articulated this morning uh, by Premier Wen Jiabao. And if you pick up not just the language, not just the rhetoric associated uh, with green growth, with resource conservation, with resource efficiency, but the specific targets that are being set into the longer term, one senses that a very large marketplace is being created that we have not yet filled out, but the people on this panel have some contribution to make, not just in the world of ideas, but also in the material world, presenting technologies and business ideas uh, that we hope we will find fascinating. And we're going to begin with a Chinese contribution. We're going to start um, with a very remarkable story about a very remarkable company, um, led off by its chairman and, and CEO, uh, Gao. Gao Jifan is the uh, chairman and chief executive officer of Trina Solar. And uh, he's going to give us a, a brief uh, description of, of how things have developed there and answer the, the key question that we face, and all the panelists will pick up in one way or another this morning, this afternoon, is as major economies shift to a low carbon model, what are the implications for business globally? Gao Jifan. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Indeed, in Premier Wen's speech, he mentioned during the 12th five-year program period, the percentage of non-fossil fuel in China's energy structure will be significantly increased. Indeed, China is one of the fastest growing countries in the world, and in the future, uh, energy shortage is going to be a serious challenge for us. One uh, solution is to reform our energy structure, and more importantly, we need to develop alternative sources of energy. Chi the Chinese government has uh, made huge investment in, in, in alternative energy over the last several years or so. The Chinese government has introduced new policies to integrate the electricity um, generated from alternative sources into the power grids. Based on my experience, I want to share my thoughts with you. I am an entrepreneur. 
I uh, graduated uh, from college and got my master's degree in 1988. I had planned to go to UC Berkeley to pursue my doctor's degree, but uh, I decided to stay in China and started my own company and created a company that specialized in solar energy. China is uh, rich in resources, and people w were ask me, asking me back then, what are your thoughts about uh, creating solar energy? Well, my initial thinking was um, creating low-cost, uh, universally available solar energy to the general public, and people were telling me that that was a mission impossible, but uh, we are uh, making our steps towards that dream. and. Uh, Trina Solar has now developed into one of the leaders in this area. And China itself has emerged as uh, one of the most innovative countries in the world in solar energy. And uh, I believe there will be more and more emerging countries that will push the development of solar energy, because solar energy is reliable, clean, and efficient. And I believe by 2025, solar energy will become a very important component of many countries' energy mix. And by 2020 to 2025, um, the pricing structure for solar energy as part of the power grid will be much more optimized than it is now, so that in the future, solar energy will play the important role, just as we see the thermal energy right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we will certainly return to some of these technological innovations and the capacity we might have to scale them up so that a, a low carbon pathway is possible for many different economies. But let's now turn to, to Klaus, Klaus Kleinfeld, who's the chairman and CEO of, of a very significant global enterprise, Alcoa, uh, with, a, if you like, a natural position in carbon, um, but with a tremendous scope for innovation. And perhaps you might describe uh, where you've got to in your thinking about this uh, new pathway. Yeah, as you, as you said correctly, I mean, we are lucky to have uh, material that uh, solves. I mean, in a way, uh, aluminum is in, infinitely recyclable. 75% of all aluminum ever produced on this planet is still in use. It's light, it's strong, so it's part of the solution. Um, but I think uh, that, that's one thing, and, uh, and that, that's important. So it's growing in all kinds of application and helps to reduce the carbon footprint. But I think that's one thing to do. The second thing is you also have to internally work on the processes. And if I look at, if I look at what we have done over the last 10 years, I mean, we have reduced our carbon footprint by almost 40%. Uh, today on the smelting side, I mean, uh, about two-thirds of the energy that we use in smelting is hydropower. Right, and, and I believe that we really, I mean, with this can contribute, I mean, to a sustainable economic growth. I mean, on the larger, on the larger theme here, uh, my, my view is that we need to have more of an understanding of kind of uh, cradle to cradle. I mean, what, what is, because very often the debates that we are seeing are debates that uh, stop at one point in the value add chain and do not look throughout the value add chain and, and very often do not. I mean, there's a lot of uh, wordsmithing done here when you talk about recycling, for instance, you know, people now talk about all kinds of recycling, but in the end you see that uh, very often material only have 10, 15 percent that get recycled. I think there's an understanding that we need to have and a little bit more of a precision on how we measure these yeah. types these types of things throughout the value chain. Also including, for instance, when we look at, I mean, light weighting in cars, I mean, we can easily shave off 40 percent of the weight of a chassis in a car or total 10 percent of the total weight of a car through light weighting with aluminum alone, uh, which basically equals uh, a 10 percent reduction in, in emissions. I mean, these are things that are critically important uh, for, for us jointly to understand. And I hope that in the debate we'll talk also a little bit about what governments can do and how we see that role there. We certainly will. We'll be picking up uh, the, the right public policy interventions that can encourage innovation and also perhaps return to the theme of, of the right metrics for measuring yes. performance along the way because be that's obviously critical. Um, now, there, there, are, there are many different perspectives to, to bring out here, but one it's clearly very important for the whole development of this subject matter is the role of government. And, and the right interventions made by government uh, so that the right responses come in a way that can encourage the development of our economy down this new pathway. Um, we're very fortunate to have uh, Suichi Kondo here with us, who until very recently held that position in government to guide and direct 
uh, environmental initiatives in the government of Japan. And I'd be curious to know if his perspective on, on the nature of green growth and the kinds of interventions that he would expect to see, not just in Japan, Japan but perhaps in some other economies as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. As was introduced, uh, I am the member of the House of Representatives, and I serve as the State Secretary for Government until quite recently under Prime Minister Khan. In taking part in this discussion, uh, I'd like to thank you uh, very much. On the 11th of March, there was a great earthquake in the eastern part of Japan, many lives lost, and there are still many people in very difficult situation under evacuation. But um, we receive a lot of support uh, and expression sympathy from throughout the world. We are most grateful, touched, and moved. And uh, in fact, this big earthquake exerted impact on the Japanese situation and the policies we take. Two years ago, as the Democratic Party of Japan's um, uh, uh, regime, uh, when we uh, took the initiative, we have announced uh, the global um, environmental policy of reducing 25 percent of uh, uh, greenhouse uh, gas uh, by 2020. And uh, uh, those uh, to support this has not been enacted yet, yet, especially in conjunction with the tax measures to enable these uh, measures, as well as uh, the um, buy-in uh, system of uh, buying the renewable energy uh, uh, has not been established because the business uh, circle is afraid uh, that buying uh, uh, the renewable energy into grid that may increase the power uh, rate. And also, uh, under uh, the impact of the great earthquake, uh, earthquake uh, there are worries and concern uh, that the new measures may exert uh, the impact on the business activities. Well, because we had uh, such a situation, we should uh, try to see for the generation of power in a distributed and dispersed uh, way uh, without over dependence on nuclear power, but uh, taking more dependence on renewable in alternative sources for energy. Therefore, uh, we um, established a feed-in system law of uh, the renewable energy source to the power grid in the past parliament session. And um, uh, it um, uh, has not yet passed the national diet, uh, but uh, the uh, uh, measures have been taken. And with the tax support, uh, we should create a low carbon society. And it is not just a simple uh, prevention of the warming, but it is uh, creating the new type of society uh, with the distributed power sources. Thank you. That's fascinating. There's clearly a lot going on in Japan, and this potential for, for regeneration or reconstructing Japan down a a, a greener pathway seems to be very attractive, not least to, to the younger generation as well, who's seeing opportunity for themselves to, to innovate in that space. Now, Melanie Mara, you've been involved in social entrepreneurship. You advise large corporations, help them uh, get a broader perspective on their day-to-day -day business, and you have perspectives on, on, on different pathways for development from your day-to-day -day experience. Perhaps you can share those ideas with us at this stage, and we'll come back to some of these themes of how best government should intervene. Uh, thanks very much, James, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think in terms of alternative pathways, we have several decades of literature and experience from civil society and also green, or green companies across the world, which is showing how actually you can put concepts such as cradle to cradle in practice. Um, there are a number of challenges. I think that the, um, you know, the biggest challenge we face right now is an enormous gulf between the companies which have bought onto the green agenda. And let me just re-emphasize, it's not just about low carbon. The challenges that we're facing relate to food issues, energy issues, water issues, waste recycling issues. I mean, there is a very long list of problems. And we need horizontal integration across all of those. We also need leadership. But if we're just to have um, a small minority of leading global businesses, which are the converts, and we have the rump of business, which is unaffected, and certainly in countries like my own, there is very little mobilization on that rump of business, yeah. which still feels that it, it can externalize the social, the environmental, the ethical costs. 
So we'll certainly come to the policy issues around the role of uh, extended producer responsibility, etc. But we're finding in our own work that a number of alternatives are already in play. In India, we've just been amassing information on very new social business models where young entrepreneurs in particular, because there is a fundamental generation gap, yes, I think. Exactly. There is a totally different set of expectations yeah. by young people in my country about how they should be using new information about their societies, about access to new media and information technologies to totally refashion the yeah. social compact. We don't have a social compact. They want a social compact. They want to ensure that business actually has a social purpose and meets very basic social, housing, environmental, um, and economic needs of people. So the ideas right. are out there. Jane and I do. Long experience in the world of politics, now business and investment in South Africa. Much of the debate about the green economy has been led, if you like, in the north. But I know from discussing with you in various parts of the world, including at the forum in Cape Town, the innovation and the development of ideas that are taking place in the south and you've been involved with. Um, perhaps a perspective from South Africa on green growth and some of your personal experience of how hard this is to do, but how important it is as well. Okay, we, we, we're an investment company which inter alia invests in a, a very old technology coal-based uh, uh, power station on the one hand, and on the other hand we have uh, developed together with the uh, power utility in South Africa a new uh, technology for the smart uh, grid. Initially we started off as something to stop blackouts and then it developed into something much more ahead of its time. Very uh, cool and exciting uh, stuff. Um, and I think the, the, uh, the learning that we, we have from this, of course, is that you know, when it comes to old technology and old business models, it's much easier to do business. You know, you know your path to revenue, you know your path to contract, capital is available. So it's much easier to fund and develop uh, established businesses. And it'll continue for some time. But businesses that are at the cutting edge are much higher risk uh, in regulated markets like South Africa. It's much more difficult to see your part to, to revenue, even if your technology partner is the one that you're trying to sell the product to. So, and, your, and your access to capital is very constrained. So I think we've, we've had, uh, since the exciting time in Cape Town, many more uh, bruises and uh, realization that actually on the ground it will take quite a long time to implement business models that are based on uh, a different way of doing things. And that's because I think uh, in the World Economic Forum, if you were an alien visiting uh, Earth and you had only have the World Economic Forum as your benchmark, you'd think this planet was in wonderfully safe hands <laughs> with brilliant, smart people and wise <laughs> leaders. But in the real world, actually, the tendency is towards the centuries-old legacy technology yeah. that we have in place. So I think the, the challenges for, for uh, you know, what the Chinese are doing, what the Japanese are doing, for, for all of that to drive uh, 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 developments forward, and uh, fortunately, South Africa, Brazil, India, you know, you, you are finding these uh, positive uh, signs as well, but it will take quite some time and patience to uh, actually succeed. I'm going to come to this great and wise and brilliant audience in a minute, so start preparing uh, your questions. But just a, a, a quick roundup of some themes that we might want to, want to deal with some more. We're going to come back to the vital role of government to set directions, to create the right policy frameworks. We've been hearing about Japan and feed-in tariffs and incentives in, in the five-year plan for, for your business, Gauji Fan, and you know, some experiences around the world of what, what we think will work, but we accept that there's going to be some experimentation. These, these, are, these are big changes. They're going to take time. We haven't got all the answers, but we do expect some leadership from government to help organize the business response to incentivize the business response. We are aware that there are incumbent technologies, there are strong vested interests. Uh, they were nicely discussed in the previous panel in this room. Um, but we also know that there will be disruption, it will be exciting, uh, there will be new technologies, uh, and they will find much larger markets because of this new demand that are being created. We've also heard um, that there is an intergenerational 
factor here, vital importance, because the resource depletion issue, the climate change issue, is clearly a, a legacy passed on from generation to generation. There are, in some sense, conflicts between priorities. Uh, the generation now in power has to find ways of looking after a future generation, but with some pressing current needs. And that's another investment challenge, how to make uh, uh, investment available for the longer term. We find our capital markets struggling to provide the risk capital for entrepreneurship, for changes in business models in times of insecurity. So that risk capital is hard to get. Long-term finance is very hard to get. Uh, it's sometimes easy to get in economies such as this where there is a long-term plan and where relatively cheap capital is available to grow sectors that are strategic for the long-term interests of an economy like China. So all of these issues seem to be in play. It's a very exciting place, but it's very difficult to get your handle, handle on things that can be done right now that will get you a good, good investment or political return. So before I turn to all of you, I'm just going to test the panel out very briefly, instinctively, on what interventions do you think might stimulate the best reaction out of the business community towards this low carbon growth pathway. Uh, it's slightly artificial to pick a single example or a cluster, but I think I'd like to try anyway because I think your instincts will be good. And I'm, I might just start with Melanie. If you, if you were to just give your advice to political leaders in particular, choose this and we think we'll set take the first good steps down a low carbon pathway, what would it be? You know, what's been really striking talking to leading green entrepreneurs in India, and these are CEOs, not just entrepreneurs, but also CEOs of big businesses, is those who are doing the right thing for the right reason feel, don't feel rewarded in the marketplace. Right. They don't feel that their customers are rewarding them. And they feel we're doing the right thing because we are driven by the right set of convictions. We would still want to be around and we want to be successful in another 10 years, 20 years. I think there are two ways in which businesses like those can be supported and uh, motivated to continue on that path. The first is for the government to provide some means of recognizing their good works through the fiscal and taxation system. Right find some ingenious way of doing that. Um, the second is for there to be more credible kite marks of excellence, right. such that you can actually differentiate yeah. between a company which is actually doing good, not yeah. just talking about doing good, measurably, verifiably doing good. That's a link also as to Klaus' point greenwash. about good metrics and good, good data. So those two things. Yeah, lovely. Klaus, is, uh, a response? Let, let me talk, uh, give you two specific examples that I've seen in my lifetime working enormously well and at the time when they got started you wouldn't even notice them. Why is Denmark, I mean ha before China became the, the center of the, the wind industry, Denmark was the center of the wind industry, why is that so? Um, having gone there in my youth uh, all the time and seen how people have been experimenting with it, there was one single change of legislation in Denmark, and this was in the 80s, where the Danish government decided to, that if you are producing energy, you can have the meter go backwards. Uh, and, and that would mean that you would actually get the same amount that you would have to pay for a kilowatt hour I mean, the respective yep. utility would have to pay you if you were producing energy, right? That's, that alone, I mean, let hundreds of farmers, you know, that didn't have anything to do in wintertime experiment with wind energy, right? Yeah. And here we see what innovation can produce, right? That was one thing. The second thing I've seen in Germany, and uh, I still remember, I mean, Germany is a country that loves to drive cars. Uh, we all know that, and has autobahns and loves to drive fast. You know, it was an unbelievable shock in my youth when there was, I think it was four weekends, autobahns were closed down. And it was the oil shock, you know, and it became crystal clear. You could not drive. That was like, I mean, you take, I mean, beer away. That was probably, <laughs> probably worse, you know. All the soccer team is going to lose, you know. So something like that, a real shock. And on top of it, uh, there was a huge tax 
on, on gasoline, yeah. huge tax on gasoline. Gasoline was extremely expensive. So what has that led to? I mean, when you look at today's innovation in type of uh, fuel consumption, I mean, there's no, there's no surprise yet that you see when it comes to motor technology. I mean, those countries that have made it extremely difficult to use gasoline, extremely expensive, were the ones that were driven through efficiency at a very early point in time, you know? These things work very well. So as a regulatory intervention, that encouraged innovation. There's a fiscal measure that put a price, and you, yeah, you know, and price on carbon is one way to do that. And there's a cultural effect from the, it, the it shock, if you absolutely, like. Absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, the, one example that also I think is a great example is obviously uh, John F. Kennedy's, I mean, plan, go to the moon. A mission. Which is the yeah. emission, emission yeah. comes also from a shock, by the way, the yes. Sputnik shock, yep. right? Yes. And saying we take that as an opportunity and we move yep. forward. Yep. And we had a sense of that a bit this morning, uh, you know, emission, you know, this, <laughs> Resource efficiency right. is going to be the way economies develop and manage risk associated with conflict over scarcity. And this is, this is we, I'm very keen to make this connection between managing risk for an economy and low carbon growth. You can use low carbon growth as a device for dealing with climate change. You can use it for, as a device for managing resources efficiently. And you can find a way of having a more stable economic pathway in front of you. And these things uh, we need to explore a bit more with the audience. Any other? Jen, if you're a pick one, yeah. an you intervention. Know, the, McKinsey has done a very interesting uh, study. And if you look at that, the, the low-hanging fruit that's available for developing a low-carbon economy is really the uh, area of uh, energy efficiency. And there's a whole range of uh, relatively cheap but high-impact interventions that can be quickly done and which would take out 30 to 40 percent of the uh, uh, potential emissions in the world in the next 20, 30 uh, yeah. years. And in order for that to really take off, I think uh, the, key, the key thing is that people need to have information where you can measure what you're doing and you can see the financial uh, consequences of that. Because that, that I think is the key. Business is not, yeah. no matter how, what convictions yep. they are, you're driven by a view of the financial implications of what you're doing, right. whether to invest, whether right. to deal with your right. costs right. in certain ways. So a, a regulatory change with a smart meter and a smart grid where you could exchange not just data but value. Oh, did you notice the way I was? <laughs> Would be very, very smart, good. Very smart. <laughs> okay. Um, well, yes, go, go ahead, John. Oh, 在能源、未来能源、能源这个机构的一个这个选择上面，我觉得就是要。For most of the energies that we use, for example, gas or coal, that is the traditional energy. And eventually, the co and in terms of the use of well, right now we still face many difficulties or loopholes in utilizing solar energy, in particular due to uh, unpredictable weather conditions. Uh, we still have a lot of unpredictabilities in energy conservation systems. But I believe we have a very clear direction forward. Once we are, com we are very sure about the way forward, then we can be very confident about how to solve the challenges in front of us. And I'm very confident that we can be very successful in further utilizing solar energy. And once we are sure about the direction, then the government uh, should introduce the right policies, the right incentives to support the development of, the indus of this industry. Government policy support is uh, very essential for promoting uh, the development of this industry. I know in Japan, in Germany, uh, which are the forerunners of solar energy, in those countries, uh, the government and the enterprises have the right incentives in place to uh, be willing to invest in this industry and to grow solar energy in real earnest, despite the uh, 
occasional failures. On the whole, they have been、uh, they have been very successful in developing solar energy in Japan, in Germany, and on the whole, they have greatly optimized their energy structure. I have been engaged in the solar energy industry for about 14 years, and based on my experience, I think solar energy plays a、um, is going to play an even more important role in our society, which is going to be beyond our, all our imagination in the coming years. Thank you. I think we'll come back to how how big a part of the future these technologies could be. Um, but let me just finish off、uh, with Suichi Kondo. If you have a, a, a particular instinct from your political experience as to what public policy interventions might be most effective in in creating this pathway to to low carbon growth. あのまあ先ほどもちょっと。経済の成長と低炭素社会をどういうふう作っていくその過程におけるバランスをどうとっていくかが難しいというお話をしましたがあの非常に最近日本で行われた一つのシステムとして、まあ、あの大きな成果を得た。A、uh, pricing system for the energy saving consumer electronics, and the buyers uh, uh, get the point back, and it could be used for purchasing consumer uh, uh, electronics uh, devices and also for housing the eco point system when the good heat insulation、uh, device is、uh, put in houses. Then the,、uh, the owner of the house will get the points and could, be, uh, could uh, save the cost. So, this kind of measures will. Will be introduced and promote the awareness among the people, and also promotion of the low carbon、uh, society. And it was very well received, and the government is further em emphasize that, as Mr. Gao Jifan mentioned. The, in Japan, because of the regular checkup of the nuclear power plant、uh, in this、uh, country, and when they do not reopen,、uh, then in May next year, all these、uh, power plants will be stopped. And we cannot、uh, switch to no nuclear power、uh, society overnight. But what、uh, becomes important is uh, to uh, promote the use of、uh, renewable energy and the solar energy and the wind energy. With the feeding system and also fiscal and public support,、uh, uh, public finances support to those、uh, industrial sectors. So, again, just to, to, to recap, we've had expressions of、uh, support for, for regulatory intervention that puts a, puts a price on carbon one way or another, not necessarily in a single form, but one way or another puts a price on carbon. We've had a, a, a strong connection with the consumer. Made through these initiatives in Japan, where you get a, a, a payback from, from purchasing, which it responds in some way to managed request for a reward that connects the consumer and the manufacturer.、Um, we've, we've seen opportunity come to a, a whole industrial sector from clear public policy making in a direction,、uh, a mission, if you like, set by the Chinese government here for the solar industry. And we've got examples of business innovation happening around. Better metrics, uh, uh, a better display of performance、uh, that people can feed off literally in the, in the business environment. Before I come to all of you in a moment,、uh, let me just go around again and look for the kinds of、um, innovations, both business and technological, that you see offering best prospects now that we have some sense of the necessity of government intervention. Uh, in many forms, without picking a single uh, uh, standout measure, which technologies, which business models, which ways in which our business community could adapt and develop to these challenges do you find most promising? Who would like to lead off there? Anybody? Klaus, have you got a, a, a yeah, something I, I, you can I, see in your,、uh, yeah, in your sites? Yeah, connecting to a thing that was said before, so let's start with businesses. I mean, why are businesses doing it? I mean, businesses are first of all doing it because the economics work out,、yeah. right? So that, that would be a good thing if the economics would work out. Secondly, I, it would be good if you were to see that there would 
be a stronger push on the consumer side to go for the right, I mean, choices, right? That's where, where we're connecting to the earlier debate. And I think, thirdly, you said it right. I, I think that the generation that we recruit today has a very, very different social consciousness and very different standards and, and wants to see and wants to only work for companies that are sustainable. And they are very good with social networks to distinguish between those that just have that on glorious PR paper and that really don't do it. And given also the new realities that the media is not really controlling the message anymore, but social media do. I mean, so if a company basically doesn't match up the behavior and truth to what they say, I think the likelihood that you yeah. will be discovered is very, very high. Yeah. You know, and I think therefore, I mean, I think, it, it, I mean, business, as a business leader, I mean, I think you really have no choice if yeah. you're a realistic, uh, future-oriented business leader. You want to have a company that is a leader in the sustainable yeah. period, right? And that, and that goes also for how you deal with government. Absolutely. The way you respond to government initiatives, the way you lobby also, and, and your membership of lobbying organizations. Well, I, I would say you do, it a, you do it in a true partnership, because I don't think that the answer is on, uh, lies in the hand of government or in the hand no. of private entities. And we have had enough no. already on this panel. We have had enough examples where you see you have to work you, hand in hand. And right? you'll see it in the audience Absolutely. for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Melanie, would you like to... Uh, yeah, just, I'd like to give three examples um, from different sectors. Um, the first is a company I'm very familiar with, Unilever. Um, Unilever's done something quite unique. It set out a very big challenge. So it set out the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan last year, and it's got targets. It's got very, very ambitious targets. Just to mention one of them in food production, it said that it's going to source all of its agricultural raw materials sustainably by 2020. Yeah. Now, what that Huge. does is Huge it's mark. an invitation. Yeah. It's an invitation to all of their supply chain across the value chain and very importantly to consumers. Join us in this effort. Make it worth our while, but you have to lead on the cultural change that will be required. It makes a promise to governments. This is what yeah. we're doing. Yeah. It engages everyone. And the word that I don't hear of enough and the approach I don't hear of enough is the approach and the word partnership. We can't do it alone. Yeah. And we have assumed that other, someone else, some big daddy out there is going to take right. care of it. So Klaus, when you talk about aluminium recycling, yes, it's a recyclable material, but who recycles it? Yeah. You have to engage with policymakers, and you have to engage with civil society organizations. So at both ends of the spectrum, there is a pressure. Um, the third point is transport. Um, in India, a few years ago, Tata Motors came out with this much celebrated $2,000 car, the Nano. It's bombed completely in India. Um, they could have done something totally different, yeah. totally ingenious. What they could have done is actually worked with the municipalities and the planners and say, what is our mobility need and how can we, as a motor manufacturer, help supply that? Yeah. They should have worked with the planners in the way that, in Berkeley, yeah. automobile companies and city planners are working hand in glove. Yeah. So these are the pathways forward. It's partnership. Yeah, yeah. and we heard an example earlier today on, uh, from Korea um, of the, exactly that partnership between a university and a government and, and, and domestic manufacturers to build a new kind of vehicle, a new kind of transport system. Um, terrific. Any, any other uh, contributions that you can think of where, where there's an innovation that's exciting that we can talk about well, in the business you know, setting? There's a lot of uh, innovations that exist that can be applied in an incremental way that can make an impact. Yeah. And there's a lot more exciting stuff in the pipeline and things that we haven't yet thought about which is coming even in areas exotic like energy storage and, and all of that stuff. Yeah. But uh, what drives all of this is actually economics and yes. politics more yes. than technology. And I think that's, that to me is a critical thing. And when people have a business case, you know, uh, whether it comes from regulatory pressure or consumer pressure, yeah. that is going to affect the bottom line in terms of their costs going up or their revenue opportunity. Um, you know, being affected negatively or positively by what they do, that's going to make the, uh, the things change. So, for example, you know, one of the things that we were looking at trying to develop our business case was the carbon credits. Yes. And we come across the thing that it only applies when you don't have a viable business. So, okay. So, unless it's a really crap business, yeah. you shouldn't apply for carbon credits. So, okay, that's a bad idea. In my opinion, it's a really bad idea. But if you were to say these businesses are actually having a positive impact on carbon emission, they should get some credits. Those businesses having a negative impact, 
they should have to buy these credits. And you don't have to put any special test and only buy it from the disabled. Buy it from somebody who's actually providing it. That, that kind of thing would release uh, businesses into a positive business case yeah. towards uh, and investment flows towards towards the, the new areas. Well, you've hit such a sore point in my own personal history <laughs> with that example because there is a policy mechanism that I think all the panel, and there are various ways to some extent more exposed than others would agree on, that a price on carbon will help innovation in uh, the development of a low carbon economy. But how you do it, how you make the mechanism effective, how do you reward the good behavior? That requires very skilled public policy making and it requires a very honest and straightforward dialogue between powerful interests, both on the environment side and on the business side. And what we've come up with is something too complicated that doesn't create the alignment of interests that you are describing with many people on the environment side wanting to limit the opportunities to do these uh, projects in order to punish business, particularly in Europe, uh, and make them perform to a, to a higher standard. And as a result, we have a dysfunctional system. But the concept remains good, and we'll have to keep coming back to it, because we haven't got a better one right now, I don't think, personally, to cover the whole economy. Um, but one thing I'd like to return to, particularly with the Chinese example, although I think there's a, there are good examples in Japan as well, Gaoji Fan, is the availability of relatively inexpensive capital of finance for this transformation, partly because the government is involved in the enterprise and partly because the government has offered a very substantial marketplace looking ahead for this technology. It's a combination of policy direction, some procurement and cheap capital. And in answering to that question, this is clearly of advantage to China, is there a possibility, Gao Jifan, that this could be extended overseas? as China wants to put more capital overseas, we mentioned this morning in Premier Wen's speech, foreign investment, investment by, by China in other economies on this green growth pathway looks like a promising idea. Do you, do you see that possibility? Maybe particularly in the solar sector. Yeah. Indeed, for the solar energy sector, the government's policy support is the fundamental uh, factor to enable the growth of this industry. And more importantly, it's about win-win. We can't just simply rely on government subsidies to grow this industry. We have to rely on our own organic growth. For example, for my company, Trina Solar, in 1996, we were listed on the New York Stock Exchange, and then we started investing worldwide. Right now in Europe, in the US, Middle East, we have all kinds of investment, investment projects going on in all these different geographies. Therefore, I believe government support is one thing. Is, uh, it creates the foundation. But on that basis, more importantly, uh, the investors should find ways to uh, sustain their investment so that uh, is, we can create win-win benefits for all stakeholders. And in terms of technology, um, previously, when we looked at solar energy, uh, we would always choose uh, places to invest where uh, we had a very good uh, pricing mechanisms in place, especially for incorporating solar energy into the power grids. And those countries would be Japan, Germany, etc. Um, right now, there are many new ideas. For example, for individual households, right now they can power their house by relying on uh, solar energy 100% rather than relying on electricity from the power grids. Maybe by 2020, I believe there will be many, many more households around the world that are powered 100% by solar energy. That is, their house will become a zero emission uh, household. And the household can become an independent unit for energy conservation. So by then, by 2020, these households would not be limited by the power generation capacity of the power grid. If my dream can become true by 2020, then solar energy can play 
such a powerful role around the world and would not be so limited by the power grid systems around the world. And my m proposal, which works so well in underdeveloped regions, especially in Africa, I believe that uh, in Africa, solar energy is going to be its primary source of energy rather than oil and gas, especially from 2020 onwards. Thank you very much. Now it's time for you, audience, to uh, bring your questions to the panel. Um, I, that last point I find really very exciting to contemplate. Um, I'd like some views about that. I'd also like to see whether or not we um, feel it's a credible proposition, this green growth uh, pathway. Lots of difficulties, lots of expenses, lots of costs, but also the prize of a more resilient economy with lower operating costs may lie ahead, with that last example being in our minds. So um, lots of hands have gone up. Gentlemen over here in the, in the time, and, and then followed by you, and then there are two back there. So. Let's start. Maybe we can just take one, two, three, and then well, four. Maybe we can take the four questions in a row. There's one over here too. So that's a lot. Let's start over here, and we'll get them in a sequence. Yes. My name is Rafael. I'm uh, representing MW Group, an engineering company for high-tech facilities. Uh, I'm missing one part of the discussion from the current business model. Uh, when you look to the past, it was always that there's the industry that needs the energy at a certain space at a certain time and the producer just has to follow. So most discussions about it's not available when you need it and it's too expensive because you have to store it. So I'm wondering, perhaps to Mr. Kleinfeld, as somebody that knows a lot of industries, how do you see the role of the industry in becoming more flexible in utilizing energy when it's most cost efficient or in, in storing the energy right in your production process rather than having external storage for it? It's in a great, to great question. I'm sure, Klaus, you have a view about that. And might also add one more notion we might want to discuss about business models changing from selling products to selling services, which may well emerge in the automobile industry in due course. Uh, gentlemen here, just say who you are and ask a question. Okay. Uh, I'm from China. I'm from uh, Zhejiang. So my question is, I would like to ask the panelists, just now you've talked about the policies in your own country, however, in the globalization, in the globalization world for a lot of developed countries, they will open their factory in developing countries. Maybe the, the companies in their own home countries are low carbon, however, the factory in the developed countries are not low carbon. One example in point is Apple. Also, a lot of factory set up by the Western companies in developing countries are highly polluted. So my question is that are those companies willing to show their, their responsibility in the process? Are they willing to provide technologies and finance to developing countries in order to solve this problem? Thank you. Good question. Um, an old problem of people applying double standards, but it, it's something we can discuss. The two, two questions back there. And then we'll close, we'll have the question in front and we'll close that off and then we'll get the panel ready. Yes, just introduce who you are. Hi, I'm from Economist Observer. My question is directed to Mr. Gao. Just now you've mentioned about the pricing of electricity. I would like to um, ask you, recently the NDRC has uh, set up the price for uh, electricity. So my question is that the price for electricity is 1.15 RMB and uh, RO, uh, the return on investment is 0.8%. So when can we earn the, the return on investment? Can you uh, explain on this problem? And also, you've mentioned about development of new energy, and the development of new energy required the policy support. So from your perspective, what kind of policies can best support the development of solar energy besides the policies in terms of the pricing mechanism? Thank you. I think we probably covered the policy angle already, but perhaps if you pick the first part of the question up. Um, yes, go ahead. 
Uh, 你好，我也是。Hi, I am also from Economist Observer. My question is directed to the Japanese speaker. I know that the nuclear power take a very large proportion in terms of the energy structure. So you've talked about the uh di the diversification of the energy structure in Japan. So what kind of resources are you planning to replace nuclear power? Do you have a schedule? Because I know there might be some difficulties in terms of legislation. Thank you. What else apart from nuclear power, combination of new sources and decreasing demand? Here we go in the front here. Last one, then we'll have the panel. Hi, my name is Manuel Tarauta from Sol Semiconductor. I fully agree with the whole panel and with Ms. Mera about the incentives and the political government um, incentives and with you, Mr. Naito, about the hanging fruits. But unfortunately, um, I see that only two big countries are really working and taking this really serious about the energy. This is Japan and one is uh, South Korea. And I would like to ask you, Mr. Kondo, if you could teach us, if I'm looking this year, um, eight of 10 LED bulbs, eight of 10 are LED bulbs and retrofit tubes, um, and this only one year, they say 50% of energy, so this is the safest uh, energy because it's really green, you save a lot of energy, and how you did it, I would really like that you teach us what you did, what programs you started, um, how, why customers now are buying so many LEDs retrofitted, yeah. um, this I would be really interested. Great question. We've made an investment in an LED lighting business and we're very pleased with it. Um, you pick up what you wish from those questions, there are some being targeted at various individuals. As you make your answer, since we're coming to a conclusion, I'd like you to just address the notion of competitiveness because in many of these questions there is buried in it the idea that there either might be a competitiveness cost in making this change or there might be a competitiveness gain. And I'd just like your instinctive response to that as you answer these questions. Maybe we'll be begin with the, the, the Chinese uh, uh, question about the solar industry and the, and the rates of return. China has launched the pricing for electricity and for this year is 1.15 yuan uh, kilowatt per hour. I can say that it's very appropriate to launch the pricing at this time, at this year, especially in western regions where the um, daytime is very long, so I believe that there will be a very good return on investment because the daytime is long. However, in the eastern region of China, the daytime is relatively short, so that the return on investment is relatively low when compared with the western region of China. So after the launching of the pricing mechanism of the pricing in China, unlike in Germany, we have a unified, unified pricing. However, we have also launched some uh, solutions for example, we have um, given subsidies for eastern regions where the daylight is short and the electricity might be less than that of the western region. All in all, in the past several years, I can say that the policy is quite appropriate. It is because during the past several years, in terms of the solar, sea and, uh, solar energy, in the world because the government given a lot of support and the innovation is continuing so that the cost of the solar energy has been decreasing all the time. For example, when we compared of the price of solar energy several years, five years ago and with now, the price for now is only one third of that of five years ago. 
and this is because of technology innovation and government support so that I can convince that in the next five to ten years the cost of en solar energy will be less and less. The cost will be much more similar to that of nuclear energy. So that we are very confident that the solar energy will become a very important part in terms of the in terms of the total energy structure. Thank you very much. Industrial efficiency and timing your production processes with, yeah. with availability. Thank you. Thank you. Important point, and and I think I said early on. I mean, if I, if you look at our our statistics, I mean, basically, while doubling production, we've brought uh, CO2 consumption, and basically means energy efficiency down by 40 percent. So so you can do a lot, uh, but you have to constantly push. On your point, I mean, we are large energy consumer, and uh, and and you can use large energy consumers. Um, in a way to stabilize the grid, because one of the big issues always is uh, to, to, to have a production that's made for uh, capturing the peak time, right? And uh, large energy consumers can help on that. So what we have in quite a number of countries, we have so-called interruptibility clauses uh, built into our energy contracts so that we basically uh, can ramp the production down even on a very short term and interrupt the production and therefore allow the, the energy to flow into the grid instead of going into our production. Um, now that requires a lot of work in a company, I tell you, and it's sometimes actually pretty scary. Uh, but that's one of the things that we are substantially working on, and 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 I'm extremely positive about the the impact that I've seen already. And obviously, what you've been saying yeah, on the smart, smart grid, would, smart be helpful, grid yeah. would be super helpful yeah, on yeah. that. Basically, bringing the same logic yeah. to the consumer, right? Making those choices on the competitive. So, yeah. uh, right, w th that said. Um, right. So the second thing on the competitiveness, I'm a big believer in the end the market is the best model in sorting it out, right? At the same time, I also do believe that for some uh, industrial, for some innovation, you need such an enormous push that it makes sense for kind of a government support until basically the plant has grown to a level where it has to stand on its own. But you also have to choose the point in time right to not have it go too long and incentivize the wrong behavior. And unfortunately, when I look at ethanol, you know, I mean, you have an example where you'd say, my God, ethanol in California, I mean, how much sense does that really make in terms of sustainability? Jendra, we had a question about double standards. Um, I know money has got some views on this too. I certainly have, having done cases against multinational corporations for abuse of the environment and human rights in developing countries. An instinctive response to, to yeah. that gentleman's question about the double standards and... You know, as a, as a former uh, trade unionist, uh, when I uh, went into business uh, uh, 10, 11 years ago, a businessman told me, you know, the difference between a trade union where you have the philosophy that an injury to one is an injury to all, and business where an injury to one is an opportunity to the other. You've got to get used <laughs> to this uh, idea. And, uh, you know, basically, I, I, I think, you know, business, my, my learning is that business is a very simple uh, group of people, and whatever their values, they are ultimately driven by uh, one thing, which is, uh, does it make money? So, in the places where there are developed infrastructure already in uh, Europe and America, which is aging, and which is built on old technology, um, they will only move to reinvest if they are under pressure from their consumers and their, and their governments and it makes business sense for them to do that or else they will lose the, uh, the business opportunity. And I think that puts the pressure on, on those uh, governments yeah. to actually uh, take the leadership in those countries. Malini, I, I, I guess you'd probably agree with that but you've got some other uh, experiences in working with, with companies uh, to, to add to that perspective. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, I'd like to pick up on the, on the issue of double standards and also competitiveness and then a unifying theme for me at least. On double standards, I think we live in a changed world. Um, double standards anywhere, there should be zero tolerance for. If you want to get your facts on what's happening with Apple, I suggest a colleague's website, Ma Jun. Um, he's a very well-known environmentalist, also runs an institute in China which actually publicizes information given by companies about violations on the environment. Um, 
In terms of the new world I was referring to, be aware and agitate not just for the alleged bad practice of Western companies, but do exactly the same when it comes to Chinese companies operating overseas. That's my motto. I want to make sure that Indian companies operating overseas, whether it's in China or in the United States, adhere to exactly the same standards that I would expect of their best competitors in the sector. So I don't want any double standards there. The second thing in terms of competitiveness, this can be a double-edged sword. We've spoken largely about big businesses, but the world out there doesn't comprise big businesses. No single economy comprises big businesses. Most of those are small, medium, and micro enterprises, certainly the case in my country. There's a woman here who's Ethiopian. She's a YGL, a young global reader. And I met her last night, and I learned that she's actually producing fair trade, zero emission shoes from Ethiopia. She's got zero help from anyone. She's done it off her bat. She's a mum with three kids, and she's made to market out of it. She's done it off her own bat, and she's done it because she has a model that is highly differentiated. She's succeeding in a very niche market. She's very competitive. But she relies on a very important factor out there, which is an informed, aware, and concerned marketplace yeah. of largely European and um, American consumers who want to do the right thing by purchasing from women like her so that she has an income and she can contribute to the social welfare of her country. Brilliant. The only way that we can get both the balance right by the margin example, because he's providing information, and by the aware consumer example, is if we have open societies. And for me, that is the unifying thing. We can do it because information out there informs the best decision making. So fight for an open, informed society. Brilliant. Final word, maybe if you could just pick up the specific example of the LED lighting, and then I've got to bring it to conclusion because we're out of time. Hello. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, two questions were raised, and uh, I'd like to uh, give three answers. One, there was mention of a business model. And after the earthquake and disaster this time in eastern uh, Japan and the uh, metropolitan Tokyo area, power supply has been very severe and strict. And the important thing was how to reduce the peak level of power consumption and how to ensure the supply to meet the uh, peak, peak demand. And then uh, the uh, storage battery became the center of uh, attention. Large capacity uh, sodium. Uh, storage battery, and the government will be supporting the, all these efforts to come up with the highly efficient storage battery. And also going forward in Japan, big uh, uh, issue is to reduce our dependence on the nuclear power uh, generation. And I was working in the environmental agency, and I'd like to make two points. Not just the supply side, but the demand side, that is. Maybe we've been uh, over-consuming uh, power, and we should reflect upon that. But the necessary power should be uh, spent and used. Then how to make the wise and efficient use of energy? And there was mention of LD, LED light bulb. In order to uh, light the light bulb or use the refrigerator or TV, the same consumer electro uh, electronics but highly efficient energy-saving devices. Therefore, the people are looking at that, maintaining the same level uh, of efficiency and the standard of living, but go to the more en uh, efficient and energy-saving uh, devices. Another is the renewable energy sources. And uh, during the last parliament session, we have realized the feeding system of the renewable energy. And also, as the Ministry of Environment, we are uh, trying to establish a good um, investment environment, to give the uh, uh, information as government where is a good location for the power, uh, solar power or the wind power or geopower, uh, geothermal power generation. What is a good location for such renewable energy generation. So we give the entire information so that there will be more investors and business going this direction. So we are trying to create such a good uh, business environment. Another point is we will be embarking on the entire review of the energy plan. And for renewable energy, in the early part of 2020s, we will 
uh, make sure that the renewable energy will account for more than 20 percent of the total primary, primary energy supply in Japan. There was mention of LED light bulb. Well, this time, uh, entire people in Japan became fully aware of the possible shortage of power supply and tried to uh, share in that effort. And LED light bulb, the unit price is low, so it's not covered by the eco point system. But people switch to LED light bulb greatly because, especially in the eastern part of Japan, with the outbreak of um, uh, earthquake, the major uh, big companies have been imposed with the order of, the, of uh, saving the uh, energy consumption by 25 percent. With it's the uh, orders uh, with the imposition of possible fine and so forth. Therefore, all the companies try to reduce the energy consumption by turning off the lights in places where people are not there and so forth. And under such circumstances, all the manufacturers started uh, the volume production of LED light and they reduced the price. So it was a good virtuous cycle created. Tremendous story to finish up on. Uh, thank you very much, the panel. The panel is not naive about the difficulties of charting this low carbon pathway to growth, but I think you've held uh, their attention for some time now. They're focused on opportunities. It's quite optimistic. And uh, I commend their, their uh, observations to you and uh, look forward to further discussions. And thank you very much.